Your Highnesses, Excellencies, and distinguished guests, it's a true honor to be here, and congratulations to all of the fast growth entrepreneurs that we are all celebrating tonight. The topic of fast growth entrepreneurs is one that's near to my heart, because as you heard, 14 years ago, I co-founded an organization, Endeavor, to support what we call high-impact entrepreneurs in emerging markets. The journalist Tom Friedman calls us mentor capitalists. Rather than give funds, we've built a global community of business leaders who take entrepreneurs under their wing, open their networks, and by giving the Endeavor seal of approval, open doors that previously were closed. Now tonight, for the benefit of the entrepreneurs in the room, I want to share some of the tips that Endeavor has learned along the way in terms of what makes successful entrepreneurs. But over the next few minutes, I also want to step back and talk about what we've seen in terms of building a larger ecosystem for entrepreneurship. So speaking of, unreason of unreasonable people, uh, back in 1997 when I co-founded Endeavor, uh, everyone, everyone thought I was insane. The Thai bot had just collapsed, so emerging markets weren't exactly hot. People kept telling me that entrepreneurs didn't exist in these countries. And even if you, they did exist, you couldn't scale them. And no one would mentor them, let alone invest in them. Now, that was coming from the US, and in Latin America, where Endeavor was starting, the reception was no warmer. Uh, I actually told the story of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak starting Apple Computer to talk about what we meant by high-impact entrepreneurs. And a kid came up to me in Argentina, this was back in 1997, and he said, Linda, that's a nice story, but has no relevance to my life. I live in Latin America, no one is going to give me money to start my crazy idea, and I don't even have a garage. Now, even my parents thought I was nuts. I overheard my mother one day lamenting to a friend that here we sent Linda to Harvard and Yale only to have her take early retirement. Needless to say, we've proven the critics wrong and even my parents have come around. But while entrepreneurial talent did exist in these markets, it is true that in Brazil, Chile, and Argentina, where Endeavor started, there was no entrepreneurial culture and at the time there wasn't even a word for entrepreneurship in Spanish or Portuguese. So now, scroll to 2001, Endeavor had taken off in the southern cone of Latin America, and I found myself called into a meeting in Mexico City of the country's top business leaders. It was hosted by Carlos Slim, Lorenzo Zambrano, and uh, Emilio Escariga, the three most powerful businessmen in Mexico. And in fact, before I went in the room, someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Linda, are you aware of the percentage of the country's GDP that is in this room? And I said, no, and I don't want to know. So I walked in and the gentleman said to me, Linda, we, we don't understand, we have a problem. We're seeing all these great entrepreneurs coming out of Brazil, Argentina, Chile, even Uruguay. Why not Mexico? What's wrong with Mexico? And I said, with all due respect, you're the big fish, and you tend to eat the little fish. I thought for sure I was going to be thrown out of the room, but they let me continue. So I said, why don't you think of Endeavor as an aquarium where we learn to feed the little fish? And incidentally, just last year, Emilio Escariga, who was in that room and is now chairman of Endeavor Mexico, he also happens to own all of the media properties in, in the country, made the cover story of the top Mexican business magazine uh, an, a story on building an entrepreneurial culture. The headline, Big Fish Feeding the Little Fish. Now, one of my other favorite moments in Endeavor's journey came five years ago when the editor of the Portuguese Brazilian Dictionary called up our office in Brazil and said that Endeavor's work had inspired him to include emprendedor and emprendedorismo, the terms we had been using for entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, into the lexicon. But I actually got into a little trouble over this lately, because last month, the Wall Street Journal did a profile on Endeavor 
talking about Endeavor's role in emerging markets and mentioning that Endeavor helped introduce the, these words, emprendedor and emprendedorismo, into the common jargon. And in Mexico, the blogosphere erupted. A leading blogger produced archival documents from Christopher Columbus showing that he used the word emprender, not in the context of entrepreneurship, but in the context of his voyage through the Americas. The blog ended with a direct message to me. Dear Ms. Rotenberg, dear Endeavor, thank you for discovering Latin America. Thank you for discovering the internet. So yes, I am officially the Al Gore of Latin America. In 2007, I was asked to co-chair the World Economic Forum's regional summit on the Middle East in the Dead Sea and Jordan, along with good friends like Fadi Khandor. And as part of this, I was asked to lead a three-hour interactive workshop on entrepreneurship and venture capital. So to prepare, I polled my YPO friends from the region to see what I could expect. And word was not good. Uh, the YPO members kept telling me that for starters, I should lower my expectations as to how many people would actually be in the room. They said, you know, they're just, I mean, Aramex and Oraskam, there are a few local stories, but there really aren't that many role models. And gee, you know, there's not really a tolerance for risk and failure, and there are no mentors, and no one's gonna invest in these entrepreneurs. And well, Riyadh is sort of taking root, but no, there's not really a common word for entrepreneur in Arabic. Hmm, I'd heard that song before. Turns out the room was jam-packed. Now, it helped, we, we used food and uh, music to draw people in. But afterwards, a Saudi banker told me that he was inspired to leave his banking job to become an angel investor. And a Lebanese executive at a US multinational said he was inspired to go become an entrepreneur. And I came back from that trip and I said, this is the same energy, the same magic, what the Latins call la magia, that we'd seen in Latin America back in the late 90s. And in fact, it's the same excitement and spirit that you see walking into Google or Facebook in Silicon Valley. And I came away convinced at that moment five years ago that entrepreneurship was taking off in the region. And I was just so excited that Endeavor could play a small part. And with the help of Fadi and Nagib Sawiris, Ali al Khusri, and other local business leaders, we did set up Endeavor in Jordan and Egypt, joining our eight affiliates in Latin America, South Africa, and Turkey. And just recently, we launched Endeavor in Lebanon. And I'm very excited. My colleagues, Walt Mayo and Joanna Harries, are with me today. And we've been having wonderful discussions, and we hope very soon to be opening an office in the kingdom. And you also hear later in a few minutes from my Another friend, Arif Nakvi, who has been a big champion of Endeavor increasing the rate of acceleration in the region. So we're already seeing incredible companies in the four years we've been here. From tech companies like an iris recognition company that's beating out US companies to uh, secure borders, to uh, th the f world's first 3D interactive game that comes out of a, a studio in Cairo, to non-tech companies like uh, Armjad Aryan's Pharmacy One that's going to be the CVS of Latin America. And of course, all the consumer internet companies that swear they're the next mock tube. We're also seeing incredible women. Uh, there's Fatma Ghali in Egypt who took a family-owned jewelry business and is turning it into one of the Egypt's f main designer brands. And Bedri Julia who created Turkey's first chain of women-owned gyms. And in fact, I was in Dubai for the celebration of entrepreneurship. I know a number of you were there. And I congratulated Bedre on 40 franchises. That was an incredible accomplishment. And she looked at me and said, Linda, where have you been? 40, we're at 120 and growing. So in the remaining few minutes, I want to talk about some of the lessons and successes and, and failures we've learned from screening entrepreneurs uh, across these markets. We've screened 22,000 companies to date. Uh, Endeavor has selected 550 entrepreneurs from 350 companies. Last year, uh, the Endeavor entrepreneurs generated $4 billion in revenues, 
and 150,000 jobs. And what's interesting to me is two-thirds of the revenues and three-quarters of the jobs come after their engagement with Endeavor. So we've really been looking at what are the factors that can predict success. So first, you're going to like this in this room because I know many of you are serial entrepreneurs. I, I heard some statistics like over 70% of you had started a business before. And it turns out that the number one predictor of success is being a serial entrepreneur. We've also seen a connection between tolerance of failure and entrepreneurial success. Um, in fact, in a few days in Davos, I'll be speaking on a panel on failure. And I really believe that no failure, no risk taking, no entrepreneurship. Another key performance indicator we saw is that quality of thinking big. And this was interesting specifically with regard to expanding in at least five countries. Now, what's interesting about this is we have seen a lot of the big regional plays, particularly in the internet, coming out of the smaller countries. So in Jordan, in Argentina, in Chile. And I think that's because the markets are small and they need to look beyond their borders from the start. So what I tell my friends in Brazil and Egypt, and I think uh, those of you who are starting businesses in Saudi should be aware of, is it is wonderful that you have a big domestic market. But, but don't set your sights just on, on what the country. Really think, not only regionally, but what we're seeing is so many models that are starting in emerging markets can be translated to other emerging markets, even on different continents. So what I've been saying is, for bet, forget B2B, and B2B, B2C, it's E to E, emerging market to emerging market. And as a final tidbit, uh, we also looked at the relevance of where entrepreneurs were educated. And I'm either happy or sad to report that being educated abroad made absolutely no difference. So those of you who just dropped 80 grand on your MBAs at MIT, Harvard, and Stanford, I'm sorry. All right, so now let's talk about common problems. We often see a lot of family businesses in these markets. And I often joke that the first lesson of Endeavor, Endeavor 101, should be how to fire your mother-in-law. Because we often see the uncle's the marketing guy, the brother's in finance, the mother-in-law's doing something, yet there's no shareholders' agreement. And I say to my teams, I can look at the org chart and I can look at the equity structure of any entrepreneur coming to one of the Endeavor International Selection Panels, or ISP, and have a pretty good guess on who's going to be selected. So for example, we'll have a brother and sister team coming to the ISP, and they'll say, look, we have new directions for this company, and we're in charge. And I'll say, that's great. Your father is still the CEO. No, 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 he doesn't make decisions. He's empowered us. No, he still owns 55% of the equity, and he's CEO. Come back when he's non-executive chairman. And in fact, we actually gave that direct advice to two Mexican guys who were not selected at an ISP. They came back, the father joined them, now as chairman, and he, he said, I'm just here to sit in the back to show I'm not going to say anything. And in fact, he kept to his word. The company passed, and it's actually doing phenomenally well. So the lesson, after firing your mother-in-law, hopefully gracefully, take dad out of the org chart. And yes, Endeavor does provide therapy as well. The next lesson is equity structure. We often, all too frequently, see entrepreneurs coming to Endeavor with almost no equity when they arrive at our ISP. So for all the entrepreneurs in the room, be careful about what you're signing. And for the rest of us, we really need to provide more mentoring around term sheets and capital raising. And for the VCs and private equity uh, investors in the room, I know there's issues with minority rights and exits, and I'm very sympathetic, but we've got to create incentives for these entrepreneurs to stay. They're being diluted too quickly. And for the people from universities, we see a great role in teaching case studies. And we also think that beyond teaching case studies of the high-impact entrepreneurs, there's an opportunity to create the next wave of managerial talent. As we put it, once you fire your mother-in-law, where do you go to replace her? And I think the things that have made Google and PayPal and, and Facebook successful is there's a whole range of C-level people to draw from. And so I'm excited for universities to really focus on both the entrepreneurial case studies, but also that C-level management. 
And as for government, some of you will be glad to hear that I've changed my tune. I used to say the best thing government can do is get out of the way, but I've matured. I now actually think that governments can play a, a, a large role in this entrepreneurial ecosystem. Number one, by showcasing the star entrepreneurs, as we're doing tonight. I think that entrepreneurs need to become the rock stars, and events like tonight and to this week are perfect examples of how we can show the talent in the next generation. I also think that in terms of capital markets formation and creating a climate where there's transparency and labor laws and, and bankruptcy laws, we can really work to increase the ability for entrepreneurs to grow and investors to exit. So in the end, I think this is about a partnership to really create this entrepreneurial ecosystem. And stepping back, when I look at entrepreneurship taking root in the Kingdom and MENA region, the similarities with Latin America a decade ago are really striking. When Endeavor entered Brazil in 2000, you saw a disparity of wealth and connections, a bunch of concentrated networks closed off to entrepreneurs who lacked mentors, role models, trust, capital. Fast forward today, and more than just the popular future host of the World Cup and the Olympics, Brazil is home to one of the most vibrant entrepreneurial cultures in the world. And I already see the same ingredients really coming together in, in the Middle East. Now, to give a quick postscript earlier to my story about the big fish and the little fish, I was speaking at MIT a couple years ago, and I told this story, and a student in the class raised his hand. He said, oh my god, thank you. This finally makes sense. And I said, I don't understand what you're talking about. And he said, well, I'm from Chile, and I looked at Endeavor's board in the country, and frankly, some of the board members are, to me, monopolists. And I was wondering what they were doing supporting Endeavor. So I asked one of them, and he said, to fatten the little fish so they're tastier. I just want to end by saying what an honor it is to be here and how much Endeavor looks forward to working with all of you to continue to support the growth of high-impact entrepreneurship throughout the region. Thank you, and let's work together to build an aquarium. Thank you.